Hello guys, my name is Charlene White. Um, welcome to my very wonderfully multicoloured box. I'm, um, I'm here in the newsroom at ICV News. I'm an ICV News and uh, Loose Women presenter and I am very, very excited about doing this session with the wonderful Fern Cotton. We'll be talking about how to keep calm in a chaotic world. You know, the last 14, 15 months or so have, have been interesting. It's been really hard for some. It's been easier for others and it feels as though that sort of um, unknown feeling isn't over just yet because you know it's that reintroduction into life really that we've all got to, to try and deal with that's like the next stage of, of this pandemic that's what it feels like so over the next 30 minutes I'll be speaking to Fern who of course is a mental health advocate and absolutely brilliant at it we'll be having a really honest conversation about how she's found um the last year or so and how she feels about that re-entry into into regular life or whatever we can call regular life at, at the minute um and there she is hi Fern. hi charlene hi everyone it's uh lovely to be here on a terribly wet and rainy day yeah, it, it feels um, almost cosier because it's so wet outside for us to be talking like this. Um, I am, I, I, you know, I feel really lucky to be talking about this subject with you, Fern. I'll just put it straight out there. I'm a massive fan of, of everything you do um, and the fact that you've now gone into this almost new stage of your life is, is, is wonderful, I think. And it's really Thank inspiring. You. Did you ever at any point in time think that your, your life would take this turn? Oh my goodness, no. And it's taught me a big lesson that, you know, you can make plans and you can think you're on a certain trajectory and it, it's sometimes, um, you know, so much better to just go with the flow and see what happens. And mine was out of necessity, my sort of change of route rather than me planning anything because I had a, a rather sort of bleak time mentally where I, you know, no, I knew I needed to make changes and, um, I, I sort of felt that the choice was taken away from me in in terms of the work I was doing and and what felt meaningful and there was definitely no plan at that point I was just trying to sort of mentally get through the yeah. the sort of darkness I was in and that led to a little bit of space I guess where I wasn't working as much and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do and then the rest sort of evolved very naturally and slowly because I felt like it was about time that I was just me and I talked about life from the perspective that I believed was sort of worth talking about and that's yeah. opened up this whole new thing I had no idea I was going to do all this and it's an utter joy I love every bit of work that I'm doing and I enjoy it so massively and the connection that I have with people and and the audience that are either listening to the podcast or reading the books or the live events that we've done previously that feels really special so it's been a very happy accident mm. I mean for, for so many people who have grown up watching you on tv and listening to you on on radio and just generally being fabulous it will come as such a surprise to them to know what was happening with you and internally was that difficult for you to well obviously it must have been difficult for you to, to balance those two things back in the day yeah, I mean, I, th this wasn't necessarily um, a problem that started in childhood. You know, obviously, I started on TV when I was a kid and I was absolutely fine. You know, a lot of the stuff that I was sort of dealing with circumstantially led to me mentally not being able to cope. And there was, of course, a period where I was on the radio live every day and my job was to be, you know, sunny and happy and entertaining and funny and I felt the opposite of all of those things but I you know I wanted to keep my job and also I think when you're feeling mentally you know unwell and you're not in a great space but you've still got stuff to do mm. you know sometimes you can't function and there's no wrong or right here I've certainly had times where I, and I, I was off work for, for for periods but other times I just went into autopilot and I just sort of put this suit of armor on and did it because I didn't know any different. I'd worked for, for so many years up until that point without a break that there, mm. there was no other option for me. So, yes, there was a period where it was very difficult. And then, you know, that was more linked really to sort of uh, depression. But then down the line, what I'm still sort of dealing with today, but as you can see with a smile on my face, because I'm deeply curious about it rather than sort of flawed by it, is is anxiety and, you know, 
as I'm sure many of you watching this today will have noticed, I don't tend to do the stuff I used to do. I don't do live TV um, and put myself in that position because I don't feel I'm able to at the moment. So uh, that's something I'm still dealing with. But luckily, I, you know, I'm still writing books and I have the podcast and stuff that I feel really safe within. But for some reason, I've got triggers that still lie in the realms of certain work that I, you know, historically was more known for. And I'm enjoying learning to make peace with that. And I'm enjoying learning acceptance. I'm enjoying the curiosity around it and talking to others about it because there's a great connection there. So it's nice to sort of see that some problems or things I would have deemed a problem can actually be a point for me to really acutely look at and try and understand better and have conversations around so that hopefully other people feel less alone in it and, and that I have seen come into fruition so strongly like even this week I put an Instagram post out about the fact that on Monday I drove on the motorway for the first time oh. in four years and I was so chuffed with myself and when are we ever chuffed with ourselves I'm never <laughs> chuffed with myself I'm like no okay that did okay but let's move on but this I felt was so monumental because I built it up to be this horrible thing and it was scary and I I, I did feel like there, there was a panic attack just under the surface but I was with someone so I made sure I was super safe um and that was a big moment and putting that out on Instagram you just see how many people are like oh my goodness thank goodness that you just said that because I feel I've had that I've never said anything and I had friends and neighbors come to me and say the same and I had no yeah, clue wow. and it that stuff's connective and I love that like that makes me I get goosebumps thinking about it so you know, I'm still working through a lot of it, but I can see, luckily, there's some real beauty and connection in the stuff that I'm still dealing with, and that makes it easier. And I guess, I don't know, as, as women in the public eye, I suppose there has historically been an encouragement that we don't talk about these things that we are going through. And to the people that we broadcast to, it makes it seem as if our lives are absolutely perfect and there's nothing at all that's wrong in our life whatsoever. And it feels as though that level of falsehood because of social media has been allowed to, to, to I don't know, be dissolved in some way. Um, yeah. do, do, do you find that? Do you find that people are just connecting, you, connecting with you in a whole yeah. different way? Completely, because, you know, so much of everything that we imbibe from the media or social media is based on assumption. Like, it's, all of it is based on assumption. If you bring it down to, like, absolute basics, the thoughts we're even having in our head aren't necessarily true. You know, we'll have thousands of thoughts all day and they might be good or they might be bad. Like, I'm rubbish at this. I'm awful. I shouldn't have done that, whatever. And we shouldn't even be believing our own thoughts, let alone what we think other people are thinking. You know, that's how removed we are from the situations that we've got assumptions over. And so much of life is based on that today because it's constant. You know, it's not like 20 years ago where we would just watch a bit of TV here and there. We buy a screen all day due to laptops, phones, TVs, or then going back to more traditional media like newspapers or whatever. It's kind of unavoidable unless you're super disciplined. So we're making assumptions all day long. And I think, you know, the position I was in when I was, say, at radio, or the position you're in now it's not your job and it wasn't my job then to, to go and broadcast about how we were feeling you know it's about delivering information or delivering entertainment whatever it might be uh, I mean on Loose Women you, you probably have more of a chance to do that but you know in your day-to-day -day, it's difficult so I think you do end up again like putting on a bit of a suit of armour because you've got a job to do and now I feel really fortunate I'm in a space where I can I can do both if I choose. I can do an entertaining thing, but also I feel there is real space to talk and to say how I'm feeling. And, you know, the reaction to that is not my business. If people judge me or whatever, fine. But also hopefully there'll be a lot of connection there and a helpful discussion, which is what I'm hoping for when I'm doing any of the Happy Place projects now. So I, I feel like I used to be under a lot of pressure in terms of that and now over the last sort of four years maybe the audience that follow me or engage with my work feel they have a, a clearer understanding of who I am and maybe some of the assumptions might be true. <laughs> I mean what's been really lovely is you've been so honest about things over the past year you really really have and I think there are so many people that 
have read your journey since the pandemic kicked off and the honest accounts that you've given online. And I think you've made a lot of us feel a little bit less lonely um, because I think that's what we've all been yearning for is truth, really, to feel like the thoughts and feelings that we've been having over the last 15, 16 months isn't weird. It's not odd. You know, we are all going through a, a real emotional roller coaster. Um, but presumably, it's been quite nice for you to be in your little bubble with the family over the past year. Yeah, I mean, I am a total introvert, which might be surprising. I don't know, because I love communicating, but I I like being at home. I'm a real homebody. I don't like going out very much at all. Um, I went out for dinner for the first time last night since Christmas. I haven't felt the urge. And even last night, I felt nervous before I went out. Luckily, it was with a friend I really like, so it was, that was quickly <laughs> the first. But I, I'm not the sort of person that is you know, um, that needs a lot of that sort of like big social interaction or, or, you know, just a lot of drama these days where I probably did back in my 20s because I felt that's what I should be doing. So there have been, you know, like for everybody, it's been a real mixed bag of everything, you know, really lovely, amazing sort of tender moments where, you know, like the first bit where we were all really naive about homeschooling, I was like, oh, this is going to be so fun. I'm going to, we're going to do, you know, build something out of boxes today or whatever. And then by like week two, I was going, oh my God, this has just got really real and this is going to be impossible. And then obviously it was impossible and it was awful. You know, nobody liked homeschooling, I assume. I thought it was awful. It was so hard. But there were amazing moments in there as well where, you know, all that stimulation was taken away or any sort of, you know, sort of social stimulation for the kids. So we were like in the park looking for newts in the stream every day for weeks on end. And, it, you know, we kind of got to know these little newts and we were looking out for the same newt we saw the day before and <laughs> we would never have done that. So there have been little glimmers of loveliness that I hope we all remember. Well, you know, my family remember because it will be very different for everybody. Some people have been in awful circumstances. But for me personally, I feel very lucky. There were some nice moments in there and it really adapted the way that I work as well as the way that I parent. But it's also been truly awful at times, like for everybody and super challenging. And, you know, I know we're doing this chat about how to try and dissipate that anxiety in a chaotic world. But also I think what we shouldn't do is have expectations on ourselves that we have to always find a tool to then get calm because sometimes you want to just scream or just like shout or you know be ratty with your partner or your mate and just forgive yourself like get over it you know we're not don't aim to be perfect in this chaos it's impossible we're humans we're gonna this is all really hard what we're going through even just like the level of anxiety and like fear mongering that's out there this is hard work mm -hmm. Don't aim to be calm every day because you won't be. It's impossible. No. Just give yourself a break is the key. Give yourself a break. Yeah, and that's constant need for perfection. I think we tend to veer towards to understand that it's completely unattainable, you know, in so many different moments in our lives. And just take, I, my always thing is just take a breath. Just take a breath. Take a breath. Someone has actually um, uh, sent a question in for you, Fern. Jane, um, who was asked if you struggle with anxiety when it comes to parenting, and if you do, how do you deal with it? Yeah, no, I definitely do because, you know, for instance, my eight-year-old is wild in the best possible way, but obviously that's challenging to parents. So he's super creative. He He's always got ideas and things he wants to do. He he always wakes at six in the morning, whatever happens, he's on and he, he has an idea and he's doing it. And it's kind of amazing, but it's also very challenging because he has his own ideas about everything in life seemingly sort of set in stone. So simple actions like putting your shoes on or doing whatever is impossible. And I, I worry on a very low level about, you know, if I'm saying no too much and all the stuff that we worry about and, you know, am I am I not being strict enough or like you know they just those personal boundaries but then on a much bigger scale I have huge anxiety about the world my kids are growing up in huge and that anxiety links to all sorts of things things that we're seeing happening globally at the moment um technology obviously being a big one that I think all parents are worried about how we are you know we can barely cope with it so how are we going to teach them to cope with it and it's ever-changing and i can't keep up with it and what does it all mean and where's it going to end 
those worries are so big. And the only way I can cope with anything when it comes to anxiety is, first of all, to try and keep it in the day that I'm in rather than what's going to happen in 10 years. Like We don't know. So, OK, today, what's going on? Right, I can probably handle the decisions I've got to make today, hopefully. And if I can't, that's also fine. But also, you know, I, I try and bring things to an expansive level where I, I you know, it's difficult to talk about without people going, wait, what's she going on about here? But <laughs> I'm a deeply spiritual person. I don't align to any one religion, but I do believe in something bigger out there. And, you know, how can we just be a ball floating in infinite space? would be rather arrogant to think that that was it in the expanse of everything. So I try and go, right, I'm just going to surrender here and hand over to hope that you know, that I make decisions that are guided by what's best for me and everyone and that I believe in something. I think hope is what we have to have in these times. And you can pin that on religion or you could pin it on, you know, sort of on a societal level, the people that you're mixing with and that you feel supported by or something other that doesn't have to have a label on it. But I think trying to cultivate hope in whatever way you can and not thinking that that's fanciful and not thinking that that's some sort of ridiculous notion that has no place in the modern world it's got a great place in the modern world and we need it now more than ever so i think cultivate hope in whatever way feels right for you and know that surrendering to that is yeah. a-okay it's not giving up it's not being weak it's not being woo woo you know <laughs> have hope. it's a really lovely thing where does hope sit for you in terms of you re-entering society i guess you know, post lockdown, we've all got our own little issues and trying to deal with actually not sort of going back to what we were, but adapting to what we want to be. Are you hopeful you'll be able to find a balance in that? I am, but probably only because I've been through a time that was for me personally, you know, hell. I went through a bleak, bleak time that I thought I wouldn't recover from and that I felt I would be debilitated by forever but that didn't happen. I'm OK. And I think when we look at the worst possible thing that you think could happen or your biggest fears coming into fruition, of course, it feels awful. And of course, it will be hellish to move through. But I think the through bit is key that there there can be real light on the other side or there can be at least a version of you that's OK. And no, I don't want to future project too much because none of us know. None of us know what this is all going to result in or or where it's going to lead us to mentally on a societal global level. But I think we have to have hope that we're going to be OK. And being OK doesn't mean the absolute ideal version of you that you've got in mind in the future, because this one sat here today wasn't what I was planning. And I feel great. So I think it's knowing that you'll be OK in whatever shape or form that ends up as. And if we can get that in, you know, I'm a huge Eckhart Tolle fan. I was listening to him before I came to, to do this today because I get great a great sense of peace listening to his podcast, listening to him talk. And his philosophy is all based in just being in the now, like everyone watching this now, you, Charlene, me sat here now, are we OK right now in this second? If you can for a minute capture the moment that you're in, which is hard because time's ever moving. But in this moment, are we OK? We are. We're in no direct threat in this moment. Mm. We don't know what's going to happen in five minutes. We don't know in 20 minutes. But in this moment, we are OK if we stop the constant future projection. And I think that's another way to cultivate hope, to stop putting everything in the future or it, it could be the past which can be equally as painful but if we can stop making the, the future so punchy and more meaningful than the now we've got more chance of feeling a sense of hope because we aren't in control and we've just got to go with life and see yeah. what happens and try and make decisions from a good place that's literally all we can do we can't do anything more than that i mean when you were going through those darkest times and perhaps hope didn't didn't feel like it was even like a possible thing how did how are you able to handle that with with the family with uh, with your kids and with your other half to be honest like a lot of that period is very very blurry and it's something that I have therapy about now you know trying to integrate memory back into the past because a lot of it was just so blurry and and there's a there's little clarity and I, and I did really struggle 
at times and luckily my husband is amazing and super supportive and he's had a very um sort of odd life in ways and um and a lot of trauma with his you know his own mum dying very out of the blue in really tragic circumstances so we can meet in that place he he gets it and he understands it and i'm insanely lucky that that's the case that i've got someone that really understands you know that there's there's a there's a darkness about life and that, that's fine that's not something to be scared of or to worry about it's entirely normal and i think for years i really rejected that sort of the dark side of life that there could be something like that lurking or that or that there was anything bad going on out there i just wanted to be in like la la land of everything's fine everything's great i've got to keep on the positives and recognizing that there is you know that there's a negative side to life and there's going to be really tough times there's going to be challenges and and that we're going to go through them is really healthy and i think that's where we find connection with other people rather than trying to shun it or you know i for years tried to sort of push down a lot of my past or things I don't want to think about you know to my detriment and I think you kind of have to embrace it all I don't know if we've got much choice if you want to move with life rather than feel like life stopped you in your tracks or life is attacking you or life is against you and then we've got to find coping mechanisms to help us move with it and sometimes it's just it's just acceptance there's no magic wand it's just you know, stuff happened and I didn't like it and that's okay and I'll move through it and times I'll feel fine about it and other times I won't and that's also fine. Just again, it goes back to like giving ourselves a bit of a break, I think, about all this. Do you think having gone through the therapy that you've gone through in that that search inside of you to, to figure out who you are, what it is that you want, do you think that's helped you cope in the past year? You know, that journey of discovering you, do you think that's helped you deal with the past year? Yeah, I think I'm now, luckily, my job is the greatest catalyst to, for me to always look for new, whether you want to call them tools or theories or stories, really. You know, I'm on a constant search for amazing stories and some stories that are painful and some stories that are beautiful. And, you know, without the job that I do, I probably wouldn't be as proactive in doing that. And you know storytelling so underrated and it's so magical just sitting and you know you get to do that for part of your job and I get to do it for part of mine just sitting and listening to people tell their stories there's such a, a lovely lightness in that like oh wow you know I, we, we get so bogged down with our own stuff and you know a lot of that is um driven by our own egos which we all have we all have an ego and again there's nothing wrong with that we can't banish our ego maybe Eckhart has managed to but most of us cannot mm -hmm. and we get so uh, focused narrow-minded on it's just us with our problems and we're the only ones going through this stuff and it's so not the case you know we're all going through all of you know varying degree of challenges in life constantly and again that's very normal and i like um bringing those stories to life and giving people the space to tell their stories so that other people can listen to them and hopefully find comfort in them so i think storytelling has really helped me through this last year right. and just listening it's been a, a real privilege really yeah uh, it's interesting because that feeds into a question we just had from rianne who was asking that she's been asked to write about her life with with ocd but she's quite nervous about outing herself um how do you overcome that especially with being in the public eye i guess opening up about everything that that you do i think you only will feel like you're outing yourself if you're not a hundred percent comfortable with telling your story because i definitely had that moment of decision making before i wrote my first book happy do i want to tell everybody that i've just been through this or like, i'm still going through it um I, there was a level of discomfort and then again down the line with anxiety and then a little bit further down the line with talking about bulimia do i want people to know this and i i kind of came to the conclusion that i think this might be helpful and that's all i could go with i think because i don't know i think this might be helpful let's give it a try and then when you're telling your story you're not outing yourself you're being you and there's nothing wrong with you having any sort of mental health problem disorder illness whatever or just you know your mental health because we've got to make a distinction between mental illness and mental health here 
whether just your mental health feels like it's a bit wobbly and there needs to be a bit of, you know, self-care involved there. You know, there, there's no wrong or right. There, there's You can't out yourself if there's no wrong or right. You're just being you and you're just telling your story from a very authentic place. Mm. And like I said, right at the start of this, whatever people's judgment is of that is irrelevant to you. That's their projection of their life, their reaction to life, their view of life. It's nothing to do with your story. Your story is yours. Mm -hmm. And if you feel, Rianne, that that is the right thing to do, to tell your story, because you could be connected with other people that will help you, will help heal you, will help heal others, my advice would be to absolutely do it. You're not outing yourself. You're not out, outing yourself in any sense at all. You're really embracing yourself and you're allowing yourself to breathe and you're giving yourself space mm -hmm. because you're honouring your story. And I personally think that's a really beautiful thing. Did, did everyone in your in, in your personal life, did they see it in that way when you decided to speak openly and honestly about what it is that your, your, your journey, what it is that, that you're going through? I mean, there were definitely a couple of concerns from like work team members, because obviously then the parameters change with how you work and what you might talk about in press interviews, etc. But they were sort of quickly discussed and you know overthrown um but in my personal life I you know I'm very lucky that everyone was sort of very supportive and it was difficult not difficult with my mum but it was um diff it was a different conversation because she has had uh, struggles with mental health over the years or mental illness I should say really and my way of getting around that was to sort of say would you like to write a piece for happy and she wrote a beautiful piece about depression in happy which is something that she's dealt with her whole life much much longer period of time than me you know since she was a, a teenager and in turn also anxiety and I think it's difficult when you talk to someone that close to you because it's there's just there's so much going on between you the dynamic is so complex between mother and daughter that it's probably been easier for me to talk to strangers and people on the podcast because there's no expectation, there's no history. So with my mum, it's been a real sort of slow burn. It's been really lovely, actually. And now I feel like I can really go to her and say, I'm feeling super anxious about this or Look, I really don't feel like I can put myself in this work situation because of, you know, panic attacks or whatever. And it's really nice that we're both on the same page not always we've still had times where you know mum's been in a really not a good place mentally and I've sort of you know questioned why or not been able to be as supportive and there have been times where I think her mother's worry towards me as her daughter have made it difficult for her to um accept that I'm in a bad space rather than thinking it's her fault you know which mm. mothers do you know we go oh, it must be something that I've done wrong yeah. which, which yeah. is not so it's complicated but I think it's been really healing for both of us and um a really interesting time for both of us now I know we haven't got that much longer left of the session only a couple of minutes really and I've been trying to fit in as many questions as possible, but we've got one from Peter. Um, this is a nice one actually to, to end with. You know, in terms of your top tip, what would you say to others in terms of being able to deal with their own anxiety? So this is not my advice. This is from um, the amazing Deepak Chopra who came on the podcast. And, you know, I'm not the one to give out tips for anxiety because I still live with it all the time. But I used my podcast with him as almost a private therapy session. And I was like, what do you do if you've got a panic attack coming on because you know I, I I have I have them all the time or previously I have had them a lot especially when I'm trying to get to bed and I don't know how to get out of them hence why I stopped doing live tv and stuff because I don't sleep the night before and he said and this goes for anxiety too stop trying to resist it you know it's that famous thing of what you resist persists so as soon as you start going oh my god I mustn't feel anxious I mustn't have this anxiety what I don't want this panic attack to happen you're you're not giving it any space to do its thing you're just trying to stop it and it becomes it sort of it you're sort of trapping it so it never leaves it it's you're keeping it there and you're and then it the tension around that heightens it and it, it's horrible it's a cycle i get myself into all the time mm -hmm. so his advice is to almost say you know if you're in a safe place you're not in a car whatever like bring it up bring the anxiety on bring it on like let this pass through me it won't last forever it can't a panic attack or anxiety will have it a shelf life 
you know, bring on, bring on, let me embrace the anxiety. Let me embrace the panic attack. If I'm in a safe place, bring it on. And it probably, and I've tried it at bedtime and it has dissipated in a much quicker time frame. So it, it feels counterintuitive to do that, but that's Rather what we push it down. Do. Let yeah, it let it out. Just let it be. Let it be there. And it will with any emotion. You can practice that, whether it's anger, like rather than go, God, I'm not going to feel angry. I'm going to keep it in. And then, you know, the next day you scream at someone in road rage because it's still in there. Let it out, like run, box, scream, you know, let it let these emotions move through. Let panic or anxiety move through you. And remember that it's not there's nothing wrong with having with having anxiety. As soon as we start to label emotions or feelings or experiences as negative, we don't want them around. If we say, oh, it's probably quite natural that I feel anxious about this. There's nothing wrong with that. Other people are feeling anxious right now. That just helps everything calm down and like lessen and for it to be more manageable. I don't think we can, you know, I might never have a time where panic attacks aren't around I, I might have panic attacks until I'm an old lady hopefully I will live that long who knows that's okay there's nothing wrong with that it's just learning that to not give it this big you know negative punchy title where it's like oh this awful thing like okay that just happens to be something that I live through I've made I've been lucky that I've made a few decisions that mean I have them less I, I'm not doing live tv at the moment maybe I will in the future Maybe I won't. There's no wrong or right here. And I think we just need to look at what we believe is normal, which doesn't exist, and what we can manage with and what we can cope with, knowing our own limitations, knowing when we can push our own limitations and not pressurizing ourselves. Just like get rid of that self pressure. We don't need, especially at the moment, to put that upon ourselves. Well, I, I tell you what, Fran, we've spoken in the middle of what is a very hectic day for, uh, for me. Oh, it just dropped out work wise. And you are an incredibly calming presence, just being you. It's it really is. Oh, it really is amazing. That means a lot. Um, and I want to say you. thank you so much for joining us. Unfortunately, I think you've frozen. I now can't. <laughs> I hope I'm still broadcasting. Oh um, no! Thank you so much um, to Fern and to the audience. So thank you so much for joining us. And I do hope you enjoy the rest of Stella Live 2021. Thank you. <laughs>